myself, uh, my blood ancestry is mostly Irish and Shilagi, Cherokee, but uh, I, uh, after the Marine Corps uh, in the Vietnam era, I um, uh, had a near-death experience kayaking down the Rio Urique River here in, in Mexico in Copper Canyon and uh, managed to uh, survive because of the Raramuri people who uh, live down there, the, the Cimarron people. And um, it changed everything for me to be with indigenous people who, where I saw such, uh, such happiness and joy and humor uh, living, living in caves. Um, and so I went back uh, and got my doctoral degree, my second doctorate, uh, quit everything that I was doing in clinical psychology and hypnosis work at UC Berkeley, and got my degree in indigenous world, worldview at Boise State. And my first job I landed was at Oglala Lakota College on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, and there I saw uh, uh, pockets of people that were doing the same kinds of life uh, as, as the Raramuri were. Um, I say pockets because, you know, the average lifespan on the Pine Ridge Reservation is 48 and the poverty and the alcoholism are, uh, are, are, are very different than they were in, with the Cimarron people. But in this, with this pocket of, of traditionalists, I became a sun dancer and was and, and in a, ma a made relative, one of the sac seven sacred ceremonies of the Lakota is the relative making ceremony. So apparently, according to the Lakota, my my spirit isn't going to go to the Irish place or to the uh, Cherokee place. It's going to go to the Lakota place. So I I uh, I, I honor uh, our starting with the Lakota prayer, and then we're going to jump into this. Uh, so just please join me in tuning in to. Uh, the higher purpose that we all have for being here together uh, and for this organization uh, and its courageous vision for uh, what real education is all about. Uh, I'm very proud to be a part of this organization and all the people involved. <laughs> Oyate oyasin chanko luto akna mani o chakiapo. Oyate oyasin. Unchi wichalapuna o chakiapo. Hecho wichosani wash day. When you are big day low. E hani la ko wichuanki tunkashi the kiksu ye. Metako yoyasin. Thank you. So I'm just saying that uh, for the to the great mysterious energies that. Uh, that may we be here to find our way into finding balance with all of our life uh, forms that are our relatives, and so that we may bring uh, health and balance back in, in, into the world. So um, I, I want to start with something that I did in 2005 with my daughter. And I'm going to share my screen, and, 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 and I want to get an interactive dialogue going as, as soon as possible. So I'm going to go through this really, really rapidly. So here I go, sharing screen. So about in 2005, when I was a director of education at Oglala Lakota College, uh, I wrote a book called uh, Teaching Virtues. I got a picture of it right down here. Um, building character across the curriculum. And I, and I wrote it with my daughter, who is an, edu uh, she's a, a non-school educator. Um, and uh, so the, the book was written about in another book called A Discourse of Character Education uh, by Taxel and Smogoski. And, and in it, I'm just gonna read the forward to you. You can read it with me. They, they start by saying a truth about moral education always being a basic function in education. Um, but then they talk about in the past two decades, this thing called character education came out as something synonymous with it. And uh, they, they draw our attention, and, uh, they say, to cons the conservative nature of, of character education. They looked at all the programs endorsed by the federal government uh, back in, this, in the time when character education was sort of a big thing. And essentially they came to 
two conclusions that they write about in their article that they wrote last year um, uh, called uh, um, uh, the ideology, the ideological character of character education, uh, the University of Chicago Center for Practical Wisdom. And the two conclusions that they came to were one is that all of the character education programs were Western derivations. Uh, one was conservative, religious-based, didactic, and indoctrinational. Um, and the other that wasn't so much didactic uh, was about looking at transforming structures, uh, social structures, um, that uh, urged teachers to seek more democratic and inclusive and just ideals. Uh, and I'm going to speak a little slower because I, I remember now that we're we're doing a translation. So forgive me for speaking fast. Um, in their book, my daughter and I were very pleased to see that near the end, they introduced our book and said, this is the only one that was not approved by the U.S. government. Yeah. And... Uh, they said that our Native American educators, uh, myself and my daughter, view character education very differently than the mainstream. And it extends beyond human communities, encompassing intimate relationships of all living things. This is a quote from their article. They argue that moral relationships extend to the natural environment. And in this reciprocal view, animals, not people, are the original teachers of virtues and remain so in the modern world. They stress the importance of the spiritual interconnectedness, interdependence of the earth and its creatures, unquote. Uh, they go on to emphasize that respect, relationship, reciprocity, and responsibility must be woven into education across the curriculum and not taught as a single course. So I hadn't thought about character education in many, many years. This is, again, 2005 when we, when we, when we wrote this. Instead... I've moved into the concept of worldview. Now, worldview is a dominant culture. It comes from the German philosophers of the late 1700s and the so-called Enlightenment period. And it caught on like wildfire. But for most of its life, until around 1930, it stopped dialogue. It was about contrasting religion with science, or it was about contrasting one religion to another. Um, but eventually in 1930s, uh, a man named uh, Robert Redfield wrote a book called The Primitive World and Its Transformation. And in it, he introduced at the University of Chicago, the idea that there's only two worldviews he said originally there were three. There was the Eastern, the Western, and what he referred to as the, the primal or the indigenous. But he said by the 1950s, although the spiritual traditions of the East were still much closer to the nature-based uh, spiritual traditions of indigenous peoples, that they had largely subsumed the Western worldview in their education and in their economics and uh, in their social systems. So um, I believe that the foundational problems that we are facing in the world come from an education that is based on a worldview that is out of balance. Um, the differences between the two worldviews, the Western worldview, and we, what we can call the indigenous worldview, only because uh, you know indigeneity describes how it was. It's not owned by indigenous people. And so real briefly, I wanna make a distinction between indigenous place-based knowledge 
and wisdom and worldview, indigenous worldview. Place-based knowledge we must fight for. I am an activist for it, but it requires knowing the original language fluently. It requires knowing the ceremonies. It requires having been in that one place with handed down knowledge for centuries to, to pre-colonial times even. There are very few of those kinds of cultures left and uh, we'll talk about them later on, on website uh, provensustainable.org. You can see some of those that we have that are still operating. But what I want to talk about today is something that belongs not to those cultures that have that unique wisdom of that place-based knowledge that we must support. I want to talk about the in common denominators that each of these unique, diverse cultures, indigenous cultures around the world share. And those belong to every creature that is indigenous to our planet. And I'm assuming most of us are. And so um, again, the difference between the two worldviews is that uh, the dominant one uh, is been around for about 9,000 years is uh, human centered. And the indigenous one is not, okay. And uh, we may be at the edge of a mass extinction now owing to this gross imbalance caused by an overemphasis on the Western not dominant worldview. I say overemphasis because I'd like you all to be thinking about this more like the left and right brain. This isn't a, a rigid binary. So, for example, if a worldview precept uh, for indigeneity is egalitarianism or a non-hierarchical society, then, and the dominant is a hierarchical society, we've got to look at that as an opposite, uh, uh, but a, 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 a joining opposite, a union of the opposites in some way. For example, the Lakota, which were a matriarchy, were essentially a non-hierarchical culture. But during the buffalo hunt, it became hierarchical. They appointed a particular authority figure to run the show. Now, a different person would be chosen for the next hunt. And when the hunt was over, they would go back to their matriarchy and their, their non-hierarchical way. So it's real important to emphasize that when we're talking about these two worldviews, we're talking uh, about a complementary uh, phenomenon. So with that said, I want to show you a brief video that will give you a sense of what I'm talking about in more of a, a visual thing. Now, interestingly, I did not write this for non-Indigenous people. I, I created it for the Indigenous people of Papua New Guinea. Uh, I'm a Fulbright international scholar and I volunteered to do something to help stop what was happening there with the Indians fighting against each other and, and violating their laws of nature uh, themselves. So I wanted to remind them of this worldview. As things would happen, uh, the year next, I was called by someone who was at UNESCO's International Sustainability Conference in British Columbia, Canada. They used this video to close. And I realized, wow, this video is for everybody. So I hope you enjoy it. The earth is suffering. Climate change, pollution, and pandemics are some of the consequences of human created assaults on our world. According to the United Nations Biodiversity Report, one million more species face human extinction, including us. We must live on Earth differently, if not for ourselves, for future generations. 80% of global biodiversity now exists on only 20% of the Earth. It is no coincidence that this small amount of land is mostly managed 
by indigenous cultures. According to 450 multidisciplinary scientists, extinction rates have been less severe or avoided entirely in these areas held by indigenous people. We can all learn to live with greater respect for our non-human life forms. This is possible if we embrace the religion and as guided us throughout our existence on this planet. In contrast, it emphasizes our relationship to the land, the environment, and all its interconnected inhabitants. Without remembering this one that's with all of life, we are doomed. Regional and global scenarios currently lack explicit considerations of the indigenous worldview. It is also important that we do our best to protect and support the remaining indigenous cultures. They are fighting against all odds to protect the last of Earth's biodiversity. And while doing this, we can all re-embrace the worldview indigenous peoples share. We can come to understand that human relationship with nature is a continuous two-way dialogue. That natural resources are better thought of as relatives and teachers. Gratitude is essential. The universe is constantly flux. Time is circular. Respect for diversity, equality, and justice is crucial. Spirit is in all things. And that human knowledge must be joined by a human trust in the unknowable mysteries of nature. Let us remember who we really are and reestablish our intended way of being with respect, generosity, gratitude, and of course, the happiness that comes from us. We are all really. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you like that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so let me see if I can find out it. Get out of that. All right. So um I want to show you what I mean by worldview precepts that are um uh the, the complementary contrasting ones on which we're out of balance relative to focusing too much on the left side. Now, there is a scholar, Ian uh, McGilchrist, who recently wrote a three-volume book that refers to the left and right brain of the humans and showing how we are way too left-brained. And he, he goes to quite uh, a, a lot of work showing the, the science and the meta metaphors of this idea. Now, he never mentions indigeneity uh, or indigenous worldview once in the whole, the whole three volumes, but he does use an Iroquois twin story to try to make uh, a, a point that uh, there is a master and an emissary, that the left, the, right, the, the, the left brain is an emissary and the right brain is the master. Um, I have critiqued that because uh, really the, we, we don't really want to look at the left and right brain as good or bad. Uh, and, and what we what, what the indigenous twin stories all over the world are about is complementarity. You always have one twin, whether it's a boy or a girl or, or, or two girls or two boys. Always one twin is the solar twin and always one is the lunar twin. In Western culture, in about Roman and Egyptian mythologies that have changed those twin stories, you got Romulus and Ramus, Cain and Abel, you know, Jacob and Esau, um, Hercules and Iphicles. The solar twin kills the lunar twin or you never heard of the lunar twin. This is the dynamic of the of the imbalance, uh, and uh, I think it's much more sensible rather than looking at at brain hemispheres, which I think is an overly simplified way of looking at this. To look at actual moral precepts that research shows are intrinsic to the dominant Western worldview and those that are intrinsic to all the great variety uh, of diverse indigenous 
uh, cultures. And so just have a look at these and we're gonna come back to them. And I want, we're, I want us to talk about how to use them uh, in, the, in, 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 in education. Um, so I'm just gonna let you read them as I slowly go through them. And it's important to note again that, that this there is this is more of a continuum than it is a rigid binary, uh, and it's it's also important to note that even though you may feel and maybe we'll do some practice with this, oh I I totally agree with this one on the left. Stop and think if you're practicing it. Stop to think if you are buying into the opposite uh, uh, that. Your, your educational systems, your economic systems, your entertainment systems, your uh, sports systems, all of the dynamics of, of the things you're involved with, are they really buying into the indigenous side, even though you may agree with that more? Or in spite of agreeing with it, are you sort of locked into these ones on the left that have in concert, put us at the edge of a, of a mass extinction and, and uh, taking away a lot of the joy and happiness in life. So we'll come back to that chart. Um, I, I do wanna say that the chart has, is being recognized now after all these years. The University of California Berkeley's uh, respected science center for the greater good uh, selected uh, our our book on this on these worldviews um, as the most thought provoking, practical, and inspirational science books of the of the year of the top fifteen, um, and so uh, I th that you know that that was a real recognition. But before that, others had recognized it. Uh, uh, Edgar Mitchell, the seventh man to walk on the moon, and the founder of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Uh, he said long ago, only a handful of visionaries recognize that the indigenous worldview can aid in the transition to a sustainable world. Now, more recent evidence is the largest ecological study on sustainability ever done. I refer to the United Nations Biodiversity Report of 2019 where they said we're going to lose 1 million more species in a generation. Uh, in it, they refer to how 80% of all the biodiversity on Mother Earth is on only 20% of the landmass. And that percent of the landmass is controlled by less than 5% of the world's population, which are indigenous peoples. Um, uh, uh, there's, th there's more that has been said about that um, in this report, uh, the global report on biodiversity yeah, and economic I'm systems. Uh, I've written about it. I've uh, said that the, the media missed this idea of a crucial message of the UN biodiversity report because this idea of indigenous world is being so instrumental and, and, and not having this rate of uh, extinction is, has been uh, put forward in this report at least seven times. So that's why the, I, this article that I wrote in The Nation is called The Media Have Missed a Crucial Message of the UN Report. Um, here's some of the things from the report. Uh, it talks about three quarters of the land-based environment and 66% of the marine environment have been altered by human actions. But they go on to say that where indigenous, indigenous worldview um, is operating, and forgive me for going up and down on the screen here, but um, uh, that this extinction rate is absent or severely reduced. So they talk a lot about this. Um, another uh, proof of this uh, is recently I was at a convention in California that was talking about the water crises. 
And the Chumash Indians, this is like in 2019, uh, had been able to conserve water like 10 times more than the other, any other community in California. And so during the question and answer period afterwards, I asked the chair of the Chumash people, um, Chairman Kenneth Kahn, um, if, uh, if indigenous worldview and spirituality had anything to do with their success in conserving water. Now, he was in a suit and tie, and uh, I didn't know if he was going to accept my question or, or laugh at it or be embarrassed by it, but he certainly wasn't. His answer was, with enthusiasm, absolutely. Spirituality is the driver. Traditional uh, water is provided to us by Mother Earth. And whatever we take, we give back with tobacco or a prayer. It is the driving factor in how we use water. We're small and can put restrictions in place and can sustain a degree of sacrifice. But no doubt, our worldview is the driver. And this respect is about balance and relationship with all things. So this is a good contemporary example. And if you want to see more, go to our website, Proven Sustainable, and you will see contemporary models throughout the world uh, of that have stood the test of time and that are now still having these low rates of, uh, of biodiversity loss that is happening on 80% of, of, of the world. And so um, have a look at provensustainable.org. Now, um, I just want to briefly give you one way that came to me to operationalize this in your educational work. And it comes back to the early story that I told you about my near-death experience on the river uh, that goes through Copper Canyon. Um, and when the Rarongari saved me, the first night that we were climbing out, um, we had to stay in a, in a, in a cave uh, because the, as we got out of the river, the, the, the cliffs were so steep that we could not climb out. So we went into the cave because that would allow us to get higher. And each day the water came up until we were on a shelf about 40 feet above the river and the water was only three feet below us. We thought we would drown in that cave, but a mountain lion called an onza, a rare mountain lion here in Mexico, walked over our sleeping bags and my partner David and I, we were firefighters at the time, and uh, we kind of laughed like a couple of kids. Did a lion just walk over our sleeping bags? And uh, But we realized that he didn't come back and there must be another way out. So that lion really saved our life. We found our way out because of the lion. As we climbed up the, the barrancas through jungle and, uh, and ultimately into snow, we were constantly lost. But a Rarramari Indian would show up ever so often and show us the way and, and save our, our lives. One of them had, was carrying a fawn, a, a baby deer, on his shoulders. And the feet were, of that fawn were bleeding. The, they're known that it is the Tarahumara, probably better to you, for their running. And uh, they run the deer down. Well, that night, after our escape from the cave and the mountain lion, and after coming upon the, the Indian who was guiding us, I had a vision of a cat and a fawn that turned into neon lights. Long story short, I came to realize after many years and trips back to be with the Tarahumara people, that cat means concentration activated transformation. Think of it as self-hypnosis or 
mass hypnosis, or any form of hypnotic learning. Indigenous peoples understood trance-based learning for healing. In fact, ceremonies are trance-based learning. You go into a lower brainwave frequency with an intention, you use your imagination, and then you, you focus on being more generous or being more grateful or being stronger. Fawn stands for fear, authority, words, and nature. The way the process works for transformation, if you have problems in the world, is to say, in what way am I looking at fear, authority, words, and nature from the dominant worldview perspective? And of course, in the dominant worldview, fear is to be avoided at all costs. We don't like it. We avoid it. Authority comes from everybody, from teachers, preachers, presidents, popes. Words are used for deception continually. Nature is something to be afraid of or to utilize, and we are above it. In the indigenous worldview, courage is of utmost importance when fear comes. And courage moves into fearless trust in the universe once you decide to take action. Authority comes only from your own personal reflection on lived experience with the understanding that everything is connected. Words are sacred vibrations. A friend of mine Dr. Thomas Cooper has a wonderful book called A Time Before Deception. You all should read about how indigenous peoples, when the trees were broken by the colonizer, we prayed for them at first, thinking they could not see reality before we understood what lies were. Nature, of course, is our teacher, and we are part of nature. So with Metacognitive worldview reflection, we can look at these four precepts about fear, authority, words, and nature in concert with the ones on the worldview chart. And we can realize, wow, I've been misguided in, in, in the beliefs that I have about my place in, in nature and in the cosmos. And I see how I got there in many ways because of unintentional trance-based learning. Now, remember during the first five years of life, children are in a state of hypnosis almost exclusively. That's why we can learn 10 languages between the ages of zero and five, if we're in a house with people speaking those languages. So many of our problems today do come from our early childhood. And we talk about this in my book, Restoring the kinship worldview, because Darshan Narvaez is an expert in child development and indigenous child uh, rearing approaches. So we understand then that we can look at the reasons we are foundationally polluting our waters, polluting our air. By this metacognitive comparison, of these contrasting but complementary worldviews. Knowing that we can use trance-based learning, and remember, I'm going to go down for you on the, on the chart here again. You can see trance-based learning uh, is, is, is important in the, dominant, in the uh, indigenous worldview, but it's, it's considered dangerous or stemming from evil in all three Abrahamic religions. And or it's laughed at because of Hollywood and stage hypnosis. So this idea of, of trance-based learning is, 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 is very, very important, not only to recognize how we've gotten to our problems, but how to transform. Self-hypnosis is all you need to do. You don't need to come to me. Like when I taught at UC Berkeley and I was president of the Northern California Society of Clinical Hypnosis, you know, it was about teaching people how to do hypnosis to others. 
But ultimately, I realized from the indigenous peoples that hypnosis is natural. If you want to know how you're in hypnosis, uh, uh, if you have one handy now, you can do it. If not, get one after, our, after the presentation. A string and a paper clip will do. Or a necklace with a pendant on it. And just allow your elbow to rest on the table. Hold the string about a foot above the table with your finger and thumb. And allow yourself to believe that your imagination can make it go in a circle. Just imagine it and believe in it. Don't think or it won't move. But believe. Because all hypnosis is, is believing in an image. Einstein said, imagination is more powerful than knowledge. So allow that pendulum now to start moving. And when you see it move, don't freak out. Stay with it until it's going strong in a circle. This means that the ideomotor neurons in your fingers are responding to the image. That means you're in a light trance. Now, if you have a preconceived, written down affirmation, like when I go tomorrow to this conversation with my boss, I really want to emphasize my heart over my head. And that means I'm going to do such and such. That's like paying me $300. Well, that was back in the day. It's probably $500 an hour now for a hypnotist. You can do this yourself because if you keep that pendulum circling while you're now double tasking by imaging the worldview precept that you want to operate, that's like, you know, that's, you can have open heart surgery with that. And I did. I had not open heart, but I had my appendix taken out with this form of self hypnosis. So it's powerful. We've got to remember it. Now, ceremony is hypnosis also, right? If you're doing ceremony, and, and, and that, that's another way to do it. All right, so I want to stop. I want to stop, and I know there's got to be questions. Um, one of them I'm going to answer right off the bat with the last slide or the last little thing here, and that is many people will often ask me, but four arrows, I'm not indigenous. How can I teach indigeneity or indigenous spiritual ways or indigenous worldview? Well, Fool's Crow, one of the great Lakota leaders, said, anyone who does not share this medicine does not know this medicine. In my peer-reviewed article for the University of British Columbia's journal, Critical Education, I write the indigenization controversy for whom, by whom, to address this. Keeping in mind the distinction between place-based knowledge, which only someone who speaks the language can own, and the worldview that we all own for indigenous earth, I don't want people to be frightened by this. Even though Indian country is divided in conflict, Many of my, my brothers and sisters say I should not be talking about indigeneity in education because education is what caused the problem. We have to have empathy for that position. But we also have to understand that the majority of our indigenous cultures have lost their worldview. I have Navajo students in my doctoral program who tell me 70 to 80% of the Navajo nation has lost the language and the worldview. So all of us have to remember, and if we can't find indigenous peoples to teach us place-based knowledge, we have to re-indigenize ourselves by using this worldview chart that is based on the two worldviews that are operating in the world. All right, it's your turn. Does someone have any questions or I'll call on you. <laughs> Eugenie, can I call on you? Looks like Hi has their head up. Sure, oh. I can. Okay, so going going with that last one, have you ever thought about it 
the problem of misappropriating and been sensitive to misappropriating indigenous uh, teachings? Has that ever come across your 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 thinking? Yeah, sure, definitely, and especially because I'm French, and so indigenous is very very far away from us. I mean, it's like another planet, and so. Um, yeah, the path to indigenous culture is very, very long and actually very isolated. I don't have much uh, people to talk about it. And my worldview, that is exactly what you just said, um, is not understandable for most of my kings. So that's that's how I, yeah, that's my experience with it. Beautiful. My, the spirits told me to call on you because that's, that's exactly what I thought was important for people to hear. And uh, um, I, I think that I know I know in Germany, for example, the, the Lakota is very, very popular and people are even doing Lakota sun dances. And, you know, doing the sun dances and charging money is going too far. That would be misappropriation. Um, but learning this worldview and and, and and doing ceremonies and, and creating your own ceremonies based on what you know uh, this is okay but again keep in mind that that you're always going to bump into your damned if you do if you're damned if you don't I uh, my wife and I play music I play piano old jazz and my wife plays banjo and we um we closed a, a fundraiser for our Navajo school. And at the end, the last song I played, after finishing the American jazz, I played a Lakota ceremonial thank you song. Right away, a medicine man came up to me, a, a Navajo, and he said, he scolded me, you know better than to take that out of the circle and share that with all of these non-Indians. I patted him on the shoulder and I said, my brother, we agree to disagree. Not a 30 seconds later, another very respected medicine man came up to me and hugged me and said, thank you for bringing that out of the circle, right? <laughs> so you're going to face that no matter what, right? But the worldview belongs to everybody. So you stick, you stick with it. Thank you. Thank Who else? You. Or we have a couple of hands up. Um, hi. Yeah, um, I just, uh, first I want to say that you are amazing. Um, uh, in my in my life path of just uh, circling Southeast Asia in the hundreds of indigenous culture, I've done festivals and, and conferences on indigenous uh, ways and in indigenous innovation. Uh, you, your, your clarity on the indigenous uh, mindset or, or, or our, our heart set is amazing. So I just want to say that out there. But okay. in that uh, list that you have uh, of just this binary list, have you have you thought about a third column? What would that and and if you did, what would that be? You know, because uh, the the duality. Because uh, I wind up out of all the indigenous culture, I wind up here residing in Bali, because Bali is a, still a very strong living culture. I mean, they're still doing stuff the same as they did a thousand years ago. So it's, it's very easy to, to not just see abstract uh, theory or, or ab abstract concept that, that is no longer in practice, but you actually see real. And I'm also helping the kingdom of Bali, the, 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 the lineage king, to start a character building academy. So I do want to reach out to you and invite you here and put your whatever, put you on our advisory list, whatever you would like to, to, to be a part of. But have you thought about the third column and what would that framework be? I, I first of all, I want to thank you for your, your work in the world um, uh, deeply. But Wopi Latanka, Pilamaye. The third column would be, to me, in between. Most of my brothers and sisters are living in between, and it's a very, very difficult place to be. But uh, if there were a third column, it would be in between, and I don't know how I would go about identifying the, the precepts, uh, but um, uh, it, 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 I, think, I think that in-betweenness happens 
in the process of doing the duality. Uh, the, you know, many of my liberal colleagues, when they see this duality, they're smart enough to know that rigid dualities are, are dangerous and that the dominant worldview is a binary worldview, that you're either with us or against us. And so when people first look at a list of two opposing things, one that's being considered more favorable, it's so easy to refer to this as a rigid duality. But the twin stories that I mentioned earlier teach us, no, no, no. This is about this is about complementary. This is about monster slayers saying, I'm a good shot, I can kill the monster. Of course, the monsters are our greed and all human beings, all of our indigenous people have stories about greed and jealousy and the origin stories. But so monster slayers, I can shoot him. Child born of the water, who's the lunar twin, says, Oh brother, I think you'll get that arrow before it, it reaches him. Well, what should we do? I think we should sing to him in the monster list and pass. Well, that's the way, right? And, and, and so the, the, the cold and the freezing time of the year, that's, that's not a bad thing as it compared to the beautiful spring or the summer. They go together. And we've got to understand in this very difficult way that these things that our adolescence over the last 10,000 years has brought us into with the science and technology, we can't label it as bad. We've got to understand it and we've got to sort of like the metaphor, we've got to see that we've got to balance our left and right again. So um, great question and thank you. And anybody email me, you can go on Kindred Media and get copies of the worldview chart um, uh, and you can get it in all forms and everything. All proceeds for all of my 23 uh, books go to indigenous causes. Uh, um, and uh, and so so do the uh, the profits for buying the, the poster, or I can send it to you if you just email me, and I'll put my email in the in the chat box. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Mel, you do next. Thanks. Thank you. This is awesome. So good. <laughs> Um, I don't have a question. I'm just um the the the, the um I just wanted to share uh, um some 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 learning and some um some gratitude from that learning that I've had, and it does relate to uh the world uh the the trans based um learning um that you're talking about um actually I. And I wrote down this line just then, all hypnosis is believing in an image. Um, I, I, I identify as non-Indigenous and uh, I moved to uh, um, out, out of the city uh, uh, to a place um, and I, I'm a singer um, and I, um, I, I started to uh, go down to a waterfall and sing to this waterfall. And, um, you know, uh, with time, um, there would be uh, the, pr uh, the, the same presence of an, a custodian, indig Indigenous custodian of the land that I was on. Um, with me, greeting me as I sang. And then uh, other times there would be uh, people who have passed with me. At times there would be, I would, it, it seemed like I was at the crossroads, the, 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 the place, you know, I could see people kind of moving in between the, 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 um, the um, life and death. Um, and, and as you talk, you did mention, um, yeah, this, this kind of cultivation of, uh, it just naturally would occur that I would, um, my heart would grow, um, and a, a compassion, um, and usually it would begin with, 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 uh, my own suffering. Of course, I, I, I as you said, the, 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 the cold in the spring, 
it was it's almost from my own suffering that needed to be voiced um uh this um kind of universal um embrace would 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 come um well you know most and, most of the most of the the, the uh, medicine people that I have met men, men and women uh, all of them uh, emerge from their suffering to the powers of their uh, of their of their work of their unique their unique abilities to 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 heal and so that's that's a that's a that's a good a good a really a, a good point uh, and 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 one of the things I'm looking I'm looking just uh, at the at the, the faces up on the screen and I see Kachinja uh, Napan has a a picture next to a horse and that that reminded me that if you all go on YouTube just put in uh, wild horse hypnotist and you'll see me back in the days when I had hair um, and uh, you'll see me uh, doing a, a, a seven minute. Uh, getting on a wild uh, BLM Mustang uh, and doing horse whispering. But horses and, uh, are, are one animal that is in the domestic realm that has maintained its, its wildness uh, in a way that makes it the ultimate biofeedback for, for understanding these kinds of things that, that you're talking about. And other animals, of course, too. Uh, but um, uh, they, they were really the teachers of, of, of trans space learning for me because people would bring me uh, domestic horses that I could not engage because of the lack of suffering or the lack of fear. Fear is, 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 is a, uh, we have a book that's coming out uh, that was banned 20 years ago. It's coming back out again that I wrote when I was a firefighter called Emergency Hypnosis. At the scene of an emergency, if you go, come to it and somebody's bleeding and you can't open the door, you, if, you, if you spoke um, with a lot of confidence, you could say, look, the worst is on, uh, the worst is over, ambulance is on its way, but you're hemorrhaging. When I count to three, I want you to stop your hemorrhaging. You'll be able to get that person 90% of the chance, uh, the time to stop their, their bleeding. Because this, this idea of, of, of pain or suffering or fear is an instigator for hypnosis. And that's why people keep keeping us in fear. So by learning how to control the hypnosis and learning how to control the fear, we can we can move on. So let me first of all say everything Harriet said to me about you comes true. So I wanted you to know that. I what's interesting, my life stage where I am, I, I'm nurturing the development of K-12 university and some business people in an EDD program. And I am becoming influenced quite a bit by, you know, the indigenous concept because a friend of mine, Carol Sanford, with the regenerative life paradigm, I think is something I'm trying to, to at least get my students to explore. I look at Yuka Porta's work, you know, saying talk. And the other thing I find interesting is that book, The Dawn of Everything, which rewrites history and that the enlightenment basically was influenced by North American native indigenous people, which I find quite interesting. But what, what, what I'm curious about is the more I think about this is that, and, and when I look at that binary approach that, that you had there, which I find interesting, is that to one extent in my own processing that we're all indigenous to this planet. And that it's the mindsets that screw us up, you know. That's it. That's yeah. That's, yeah, whole, so, that's why we're called. That's why this idea of worldview is there. Yeah. Worldview essentially is defined as the relationship between humans and nature, and, and the relationship between humans and supernature, or the cosmos, or the spiritual realm. And so, all cultures, all religions, all philosophies, when you look at them tend to fall under them. Now, most scholars are still going, no, 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 there's millions of worldviews, right? Which waters it down. But when you hear scholars get serious and talking about 
you'll see anthropocentric versus non -anthrop. You know, you see this happening, right? So I think what you just said is, 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 is right on, that we are indigenous to Mother Earth, period. And uh, everything is about is about the earth, and, uh, and and until we can start calling natural resources relatives in the deepest way, we 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 don't have a chance. So all the beautiful kinds of educational innovations that come out that recognize a lot of these positive things. If you go down that interconnected list, you'll go, well, wait a minute, they're not doing this one, this one, this one, or this one. It's going to fail ultimately, no matter how high, and, you know, high spirited and, and well intended it is. So I, I really am so biased by this idea that worldview is foundational and that we can reclaim a worldview through the kinds of education that Eco Universities is, is doing and my daughter is doing and, and, and people can do uh, in universities that are challenging, like, like mine, you know, where I'm always at odds with the, you know, with the administration in some, in, in some way. So um, uh, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm realizing we are kind of at the end uh, time of our session. There are a few more hands raised. I don't know, Ferraris, if you're able to stay a few minutes longer and we can take a few more questions. And if not, um, well, you yes, just- I, I, I can, I, I can. So let, let's uh, let's stay on. Um, let me- call... more, 10 minutes more. Oh yeah, I can stay on. I've got, I've got another hour before I have another call. So <laughs> let me close by playing a little song on the flute and then we'll open up the questions uh, uh, without recording. That's good. All right, this is a this is a Cherokee song that the women sang to the children on the Trail of Tears, uh, which was as bad as anything that we're facing now, probably. And it was about seeing the animals in the clouds, seeing the dancing grasses, and how they're keeping their responsibility, and how the beautiful colors of the fish and the beautiful songs of the birds. It was about the the, the lyrics to this song are about reminding the child no matter how tough things are now did you see the fish in the brook did you hear the sound of the metal bark did you see this and they're still keeping their responsibility so just close your eyes take a big deep breath allow yourself to imagine the power and courage and beauty of a woman singing this to a child in such a difficult situation and how that can apply to your life today. All right.